You know, the world may seem like a big place, but with technology, we can bring the far corners of the world right to the front door of America's small businesses. I'm Nelson Davis, executive producer of Making It. Today's digital devices can connect us with the rest of the world at the click of a button. Those tools provide a very long reach for entrepreneurs who are looking to venture out internationally. But we have to remember that technology is not the cure-all. As you'll see today, if you remember the fundamentals and do it right, it is worth the effort to think globally, even in a small business. Making it. Featuring inspiring personal stories of struggle, triumph, and success from America's small business communities. Welcome to Making It. I'm Emmett Miller. And I'm Lynette Romero. It's the epitome of thinking big. In the business world, going global is the measure of power, wealth, and accomplishment. But for some companies, it's a matter of staying relevant in an ever-evolving landscape. Companies like Kemco Manufacturing are always finding ways of serving the needs of their customers as they grow internationally. Kemco is run by CEO Rafith Ali and his son-in-law, Hader Nazar, who handles business development. Right now, the two of them are revamping the 50-year-old company. They've started a new division to offer engineering and software services in addition to their manufacturing arm. It's called Ingenium, which is Latin for power of mind. Ingenium's motto is smart people know no boundaries. And one of the ways Kemco's crossed international boundaries is by having a call center in India. It used to be that running a company in India was one of the best kept secrets in the business world after all. Outsourcing, outsourcing is often thought of as a bargain. But growth in India's local economy has brought increases in the cost of real estate, the cost of labor, and other expenses as well. That's just one of the byproducts that comes with a global marketplace. One advantage that Kemco has is a partnership with Boeing. Under the Mentor Protege program, the companies are teaming up to develop new products. As you'll see in Hader and Rafith's story, there will be pluses and minuses in international business, but for them, it's all adding up. Kemco Manufacturing is celebrating its 50th year in business, and uh, it uh, has been a supplier for Boeing for all those years. In 1992, Rafith Ali was working for a different company, commuting from Chicago to St. Louis, Missouri, when the opportunity to acquire Kemco came his way. With a career in engineering and operations, Kemco was the perfect fit. Since its inception in 1955, the company has provided precision machinery, tooling, and ground support for the military, aerospace, and automotive industries. The business uh, model for Kemco has been built to print, and that part of the business uh, is becoming a, like a commodity item, uh, very price sensitive, and the margins are deteriorating. Uh, so we sat back and said, where else can we grow and grow profitably? Rafith brought his son-in-law from California to join the company to both rebrand and diversify the business. I'm getting up in age and I wanted to uh, bring uh, someone on board that would continue uh, working with me to grow Chemco. Heather initially uh, didn't show any interest uh, moving to St. Louis uh, and then a couple of years ago uh, we sat down and chatted and talked about the direction uh, where we wanted to take Chemco and uh, with his background uh, you know all the things fell in place. Hatter Nazar worked with a management consultant firm for Fortune 500 companies and worked with software companies in the Silicon Valley during the dot-com boom. He was part of a small company that grew from zero to 38 million in revenue. Hatter's present goal is to grow Ingenium in a similar fashion, but some transitions are more easily made than others. I had to trade in the convertible for an SUV so I could handle the winters out here, but, uh, but it's been good. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very, um, uh, the, pe the people here are, are very friendly and very genuine. And in addition, I think that, uh, um, especially from a manufacturing roots base, uh, there, you know, Missouri has a lot of talent to offer. They are maximizing that talent by launching their new brand, Ingenium. 
If we look at our customers, and we have over the last couple of years, and where they're going, uh, Boeing, for example, with future combat systems and other programs, really uh, the ability to support those new programs, it's not just going to be about delivering a machine part, but it's going to be about servicing an internet network soldier or uh, supporting an unmanned vehicle. So the ability to provide engineering capabilities for those new programs as well as software development, we just felt that in order to do that, um, uh, that was going to require a fundamental shift in our core competency and our ability to compete at a different level. Ingenium has recently acquired a company in India to support some of their work. The acquisition was always part of a strategy to, uh, as we grew internationally, one of the reasons to do that is to tie into a skill base, uh, a highly skilled and trained technical base that would allow us to grow and enhance our software development capabilities. But as in any aspect in business, success comes with both trial and error, including international expansion. The first company that we uh, were close to acquiring, we ended up not acquiring. And the reason why is everything checked out from a due diligence standpoint regarding their capabilities, regarding their people, regarding uh, some of the opportunities they were going to bring as a part of that acquisition. Unfortunately, um, it, the, the people and the trust factor wasn't there. And uh, that was the big lesson learned that I took away from there. Culture is very important because they conduct business differently. Uh, if you had asked me whether I wanted to start a business in India 10 years ago, I would have said no. The government policies have changed overnight and they are encouraging, uh, you know, uh, what they call uh, NRIs, non-resident Indians like me, uh, you know, if we want to come and start a new business over there along with a partner over there. Those things were not encouraged, you know, a few years ago. In addition to changing policies, another plus in doing business in India is that they speak English okay, there. We asked, what is the best advice if you're looking to expand internationally? Look at what your customers are doing today. Um, it's a global market your customers are probably going international anyway. <laughs> so that's, that's number one. Second is look at your employees. Uh, and you know, you know, the United States of America uh, has, is people from all over the world uh, making it here in the U.S. And you know, you may have people that aren't too far removed from different parts of the world as a part of you, your organization already. Uh, so, um, but, but really, in the end of the day, it's about, you know, it's about the bottom line and it's about growing your business. So it has to provide a cost justification. And we asked Hatter what he enjoys most about his new position. To be able uh, to interact with people across the globe uh, and be on one common mission and trying to accomplish the same objective uh, across time zone is a blast. And if you're considering taking your business to the world stage, Hatter says make sure you take time to cultivate good relationships with the people you'll be working with. He admits long distance can be an enemy and trust is a key issue when you are thousands of miles away. And if you want your business to go where it hasn't gone before, experts are suggesting that you focus your mind in the proper direction. Stacy Kumagai is the president of Media Monster Communications and she's got some tips on helping you to think like an entrepreneur in our Secrets of Success. Entrepreneurial thinking is different from regular thinking in that you think outside of the box, you dare to be different, you take risks. It's about leadership, motivation, creativity, being inspired and motivated to do something outside the norm of what other people do. Most people in business operate in a cookie cutter way. They do what's safe. They do something that's known, something that's familiar to them because that's something they feel comfortable with. Entrepreneurial thinking means trying something that makes you feel a little uncomfortable something that makes you feel more passionate about what your dream is and what you're doing. And to have that energy every day to find that source of inspiration. Entrepreneurial thinking is about finding resources, doing research, going to the library, finding a mentor, calling the Small Business Association, finding about grants, loans, funding, how to increase your business and improve upon it every single day and finding new opportunities for yourself. Entrepreneurial thinking is really about thinking differently. And if you want to hear more from Stacey Kumagai, you can contact her at MediaMonster at Yahoo.com and always check out more Secrets of Success on our website. Just log on to MakingItTV.com. And coming up next here at Straight from the Pros, a playbook for succeeding on the global playing field when we come back.
where small business is the big idea. Making it is being brought to you by the Boeing Company, by the Disneyland Resort. You're invited to the happiest homecoming on earth. And by Southern California Edison. For over 100 years, life powered by Edison. And welcome back to Making It. It's actually an understatement to say that small businesses are making an impact on the international market. In fact, recent figures indicate that 97%, a full 97% of U.S. companies that export are small businesses. When you're tapping into the international business world, it's good to hear a few stories from veterans in the field. One such person is Charles Wu, the CEO of Mega Toys. Known as the mayor of Toy Town, Wu imports and exports toys with offices in China, Hong Kong, and Los Angeles. Another high-profile entrepreneur is Richard King. He has more than 35 years of experience in the global market. He's also the chairman and founder of King International Group and serves on several advisory boards, including the Japan Business Association of Southern California. And through years of experience, these professionals have acquired a wealth of knowledge and a bankroll of good advice. Both agree that the fundamentals of succeeding in business domestically will work as you expand internationally. In our feature story today, these gentlemen share their proven strategies as well as pitfalls to avoid. With Making It correspondent Errol Smith. Charles Wu and Richard King are veterans of international trade. I sat down with them in order to gain insight into the current and future state of the global economy. Charles Wu is the owner of Mega Toys, a company that is expected to gross over 60 million in 2005. Sometimes you, if you think outside the box and you find how different people from different parts of the world do business, and if you can sort of combine the best of different worlds, and then most often you come up with a unique way that is, uh, that is better than other people, and then that provides you the competitive advantage. Mr. Wu, former chairman of the LA Chamber of Commerce, says that he's learned to take advantage of local and international trade organizations. A lot of times the government agencies have outreach programs, like the Department of Commerce, or the SBA, they all have that component of doing business in, in the international trade arena. Banks and other financial institutions can provide a smooth route for your currency and trade. Getting money in and out of a country is more difficult than getting merchandise in and out, particularly for, for countries that don't have a good financial structure that are similar to ours. And with today's technology, the entrepreneur doesn't have to travel as much as one might think. I have to visit uh, different country maybe two, three times a year. It's a lot less than most people do in the international business arena. I do that because I communicate with my Hong Kong office, my China office, every day by, in by internet, emails, telephone calls. According to Mr. Wu, one of the most important things to be aware of when performing research is cultural differences. I remember uh, maybe a few years ago, there were a uh, owners of a Japanese major company coming here to enter the business agreement with us. And, you know, the, the usual wine and dine, and then they stay in my office after dinner and keep smoking and didn't want to go home. And I could not figure out whether I'd done anything wrong, why wouldn't they leave, why, but why wouldn't they go into the, 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 the substance of the discussion. And then later, you know, I was very patient, but I keep wondering what, what was the matter with these people. They are not talking. They're just sitting there and smoking with me. And it was a smoke-filled room. I wasn't getting uncomfortable. But then later I find that was the way to bond, and that was the way that they, they want you to feel comfortable with them. Richard King of King International Group has over 40 years of experience in Pacific Rim trade. He believes that when considering doing business internationally, one must have their priorities in order. The way to look at international business is that you have a commitment to it, it's going to be part of a mainstream effort within your business plan, and you go for it, and you also have the financial resources to support that. There are several growth industries to consider. I think some of the hot areas right now for the types of business, I think healthcare is a big business, healthcare products of all kinds, a big business. Obviously, the lower end of technology doesn't have to be the high-tech side, but the low-tech side. This might sound strange to you, but 
since we're importing apparel from Asia and all over the world, but there is a small niche for high quality apparel, in, in, particularly in Asian markets. So these are some of the areas. There are many ways to be ahead of the curve if you form the correct alliances. You bring in your custom brokers and your freight forwarders and your export managers. You bring in your banks. They handle all those things. Uh, you can even talk to the, uh, the tariff commission or talk to the experts in foreign government and they'll give you uh, the tariff rates you've got to live with. And though it's important to be aware of the regulatory and currency issues, Richard says it's critical to build trust. They've got to be a trustworthy person. They've got to project that trust to their potential uh, customer or their potential partner. And the only way you do that, that's one thing you can't do by email or internet or with computer technology. That's a face-to-face -face situation. So in my opinion, one of the first things you have to do if you're interested in international business is physically be out there in the marketplace meeting the people that you're wanting to do business with, be that a customer or a partner or a distributor or whatever it is, and get to know them. Mr. King predicts that the impact of international trade will also provide several opportunities for growth domestically. One is certainly the growth in the warehousing activity because we're going to have much more exchange, many more imports, so warehousing is going to be a very important growth area. I think the area of transportation uh, we have to deal with right now, we have ports that are virtually deadlocked out there because of ships waiting to be unloaded, etc. So we have to come up with new means of transportation, and so the trucking industry is going to uh, benefit from this uh, as well. And while daunting, the prospect of investing overseas is a promising one. The opportunities, particularly in the Pacific Rim markets, are just incredible. I think the opportunity for small to medium-sized business in America is to do business with other small to medium-sized businesses in those countries. And listen to this. Richard King says, when you're doing business with other countries, emphasize the similarities. The differences are obvious. They speak for themselves. In the meantime, Charlie Wu spends time mentoring other small toy retailers to become better business owners. And next on Making It, we sit down with an executive of one of America's largest exporters, Norma Clayton, Vice President of Supplier Management and Procurement at the Boeing Company, is here. And she's going to tell us what they're doing to keep the gateway to international business open. Welcome back to Making It. Networking is a powerful tool in business, and you can further develop your international market strategy by contacting today's guest. For Hatter Nazar and Rafath Ali of Chemco and Ingenium, the web address is ingenium.com, and you can email Charlie Wu of Megatoys at charlie at megatoys.com. Richard King of King International Group can be reached at 626-792-6896, but now Lynette Romero has a very special guest in our studio. Thanks, Emmett. Well, if you've ever taken a trip by plane, you've probably sat in one of their jets. The Boeing Company is a leader in the aerospace industry, grossing over $50 billion annually. For Boeing, global expansion is more than just selling products overseas. It's about building communities within the countries they do business with. And Norma Clayton, Vice President of Supplier Management and Procurement at Boeing, is here now to tell us more about that. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Making It. Thank you very much, Lynette. Well, we know that Boeing is the world's biggest exporter. So give us a snapshot of the company's businesses overseas. Uh, today, about 8% of our sales on the military side of our business are done outside the U.S. And on our commercial side, about 70% of our sales. So as you can see, for a $50 billion business, we have an extensive amount of our dollars tied up in international markets. How can a business here determine if there's really a market for their product overseas? What's the first thing they should be thinking about? I think the first thing is they need to understand what their product offering is going to be. And once they've decided what that's going to be, then they need to do a very in-depth market analysis, looking at the economic viability, because you are dealing with different currencies, understanding the geopolitical issues in the country, making sure that they understand the time and the investment that's going to be required to sell that product internationally. Can you talk about the infrastructure that's going to be required for a small business to go international? The number one thing that they're going to need is a very good attorney. An attorney that <laughs> really? understands, absolutely, because there are a lot of challenges. You're dealing with different cultures, different right. laws, 
you're dealing with import and export issues. Uh, again, currency and the whole banking industry may be different. Um, you may need translational services to help you understand and be able to negotiate the types of contracts. And also, you're going to have to ensure that the right environmental controls are in place, assuming that you have a product that is environmentally sensitive. So what can they expect to see happen when it comes to time and resources? What should they really expect? Well, as far as the time is concerned, they, they need to expect to spend a lot of their time in that country. Once they've determined who they're going to partner with, how they're mm -hmm. going to sell their and market their product, they need to spend time there building the relationships. When you do businesses globally, building trust and building relationships are essential before you can conduct business. Right. So if the trust isn't there, uh, you're, in a, you're going to be um, unable to do business there. The other thing is understanding who the key influencers are in the country because a lot of the uh, foreign countries have ministries of defense that you have to seek counsel from before you can do business there. Really have to make a commitment. Absolutely. That's a big commitment. Can you talk about for Boeing vendors what kind of guidance and support that you offered them to develop those connections internationally? Yes, for Boeing suppliers there are a number of uh, support services that we offer through our website and through the relationships that we have with our suppliers. We have what are called strategic partnerships and through those we can offer counseling and coaching, we can offer various websites, we can even, even offer financial counsel mm -hmm. um, from our corporate offices to help them understand what some of these issues are that they're going to be dealing with. But more fundamentally, we can assist with the infrastructure and help them reduce the cost of the infrastructure that would be required to go overseas because they wouldn't be going alone. They would be going as one of our partners. And, and that's probably the best way to do business internationally is to go with someone else that can help you share that risk. So you take them under, their, under your wing? Absolutely. Your big Boeing wing? Absolutely. Whether it's in <laughs> it's a, a mentor, it's a big wing. Whether it's through a mentor protege or right. through a joint venture or some type of a strategic alliance. Okay, let's talk about what areas are a good first step for a business if they want to go beyond the U.S. borders. I, I would think that you would start with countries that are more neutral territories, such as the United Kingdom or Central Europe or Canada, because their laws are similar. Um, to ours. Their attorneys tend to understand both sets of laws. Mm -hmm. um, export control isn't as difficult. Um, the currency exchange isn't as difficult. The geopolitical issues, both of those locations are pretty neutral and politically stable. And they speak English. So all of those factors weighed together substantially reduces the risk for a small business. Real quickly, you talked about things to watch out for. What about some of the positives? Real quick. There are a lot of positives. The ability to grow your portfolio in good times and bad the ability to team and get into markets that otherwise wouldn't be afforded to you, and most importantly, the ability to adapt to rapidly changing technology and innovation. Lots of information. I'm sorry we're out of time. That's okay. Thank you so much. Whether it's local or international business, you have got to get connected. So coming up next, we'll tell you how you can contact today's studio guest, Norma Clayton. So stay with us. In praise of the entrepreneurial spirit, Making It is being brought to you by Sempra Energy, a Fortune 500 energy services company committed to building a diverse supplier base. By Honda, the power of dreams. And by Comerica Bank. We listen, we understand, we make it work. You know, Norma Clayton gave some really important information about international expansion. You can reach her at the Boeing Company. The address is 100 Airport Way, St. Louis, Missouri, 63134. And if you have business questions or you want to share your business experience, you can take part in our Entrepreneurs Forum. That's where business owners discuss everything from starting a business to marketing. To get in on the conversation, just log on to our website at makingittv.com. Speaking of which, that does it for this edition of Making It. I'm Emmett Miller. Take care.